hospitalizations, travel to and from medical appointments, and truly anything a patient needs in order to stay whole so they can continue to work and live their best lives. To give you a little. I have a motion and a second. Senator Girdler, do you have a comment? I have a question. I have a question. Well, I got, I got a comment. Uh, the health insurance industry, and uh, Dr. Alvarado is right. He's more my doctor than he's my senator because he has helped me through a lot of times, and I do appreciate him. I really do. The only thing I don't like now, I'm sleeping with the enemy now because he's going to be up here with us. <laughs> so with all that said, every time – you know, we talk about can't pay insurance. I know insurance companies real, real, real well. I've worked with them for 43 years. You give them a half a chance to raise a premium on you, and they're going to. You give them some kind of doubt with it, and they're going to raise premium. That's the reason you have people without insurance. That's the reason you got the, the, the companies setting up nonprofits to be able to pay the health insurance. One of the things with this bill that the concern is, is that some of the nonprofits, so to speak, and, I'm, and this is not you, Ms. Cooper, uh, has to do with pharmaceutical companies, which are the ones that's charging out the yang yang for their, for their drugs. Mm -hmm. um, but the insurance companies has that fault in this too, and I'm saying all this to say, I, if the pharmaceutical companies are part of the nonprofit then they're paying in little money to make sure that they're not on Medicaid. And with the, knowing that if they're on Medicaid, they're going to get nothing back later. But if they got health insurance, they know they're going to get back 10 times more or six times more than on Medicaid. Now, that's one of the fears the insurance companies has expressed to me. Now, uh, Medic, uh, under the health insurance side of it, the insurance companies cause a lot of our problems too by, by refusing to pay you and by refusing to do things. It, just this morning, my daughter called me crying. In fact, I've got a little fourth grader that needs to be on, and I don't agree with a lot of this, needs to be on ADHD medicine. She can't concentrate over a minute or two and then, and then she loses it. And she's on virtual school. So uh, today, uh, the doctor that I've known since she was a child said can't get her medicine because the health insurance has uh, refused it. So we've caused a lot of our own problems and I understand wh why you're doing your bills. I really do. Uh, it's a catch 22. What we're doing is you're protecting them. I understand. They're gonna come back and say, Dr. Alvarado is the reason we went up or Rick Girdler's the reason we went up or the Senate of Kentucky is the reason we went up. And, and uh, I don't know where it's going to end. COVID's caused a lot of it. You know, they're allowed to, the more chaos they cause. Anyway, long story short, I understand. The insurance companies are going to come after you one way or another. And the people aren't going to be able to afford it. Then we're going to need a whole lot of more nonprofits if we, if we keep, you know. So anyway, that, that's my speech for 44 and 45. Um, if I may. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So a couple things there, and thank you for those comments. I greatly appreciate them. In Kentucky alone, our goal is to make sure that we don't have people go on to Medicaid um, if they can stay on their commercial insurance. And during um, since COVID alone, Kentucky's Medicaid population just from March to April has grown 7%. Hmm. Also to keep in mind that the um, pharmaceutical companies do have an opportunity to work with the state's PBM and negotiate their rates and the drugs that they will put on the formulary. So as a nonprofit, we receive a variety of donations simply to be able to help people stay on their insurance and be able to get the treatments that they need so that we can avoid ER visits, lower the cost of health care, and avoid people from going on to Kentucky's Medicaid roles. Our goals, I think, are all aligned in terms of just giving people the access to the care that they need. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, really really briefly, yes. if I may. Yep. So, and I appreciate that. I don't consider myself part of the enemy here. I, I consider everybody on this committee allies and friends. But I'll, I'll tell you one thing um, 
that I propose to insurance companies with regards to pharmaceuticals and some of these costs of treatment, that there always seems to be a negotiation behind closed doors that people see. What I've told a lot of the insurance companies is what they need to start considering is instead of saying they're going to negotiate co-pays and things for the patients, I'd rather they just say for a disease state, we're going to give you X amount of dollars of permission to spend towards this disease state. And then say, uh, if you have diabetes, we're going to cover $88.43. That's what you have to work with. Patient, whatever you want to get under these drugs that will fit underneath that cap, go ahead and do it. And that enforces that patient and the doctor to say, okay, we got 88 and 43 cents in our budget per month. How are we going to manage this? If you want to bring pharmaceutical costs down, they're going to say, boy, I got a drug that costs 200 bucks and I've only got 88 and 43. They're never going to use my product. I better bring my price point down so I can fit within that budgetary amount allowed by the insurance companies. And you take it out of the hands of having backdoor negotiations, set your amount that you want to spend for disease states. Maybe say we're going to limit no more than this many disease states together. There's this full amount and let patients use that as a budget. Let them and their doctors figure that out and get out of the way of these backdoor negotiations. I think that would be a much better way. It would be a complete sea change on how we approach insurance when it comes to medications. But let doctors and patients call the shots, give them a budget to work within, and don't negotiate it behind the scenes, and it would work a lot easier. But that's, again, our thinking, and I think it would be a much, a much it would be a, a big sea change. But I do appreciate the comments and, and the concerns there as well. We do have somebody to speak in opposition, and I'll get to them in just a second. But Senator Buford had Thank a you. question. Quickly, uh, on uh, page 1, line 25, it does state that uh, under, you know, extent permitted by federal law, all health benefit plans may accept. So it's not a mandate. They can choose not to go this route if they so choose the health benefit plans. So don't interpret this as a mandate. Uh, this is an, I can't imagine why anybody would not want to accept a premium that was due, but you know, if there are some people, you give them a dollar for 99 cents and they'll come down here and object to it. So this is not a mandate, thank you. Thank you, Senator Buford. Uh, you all can stay at the table, uh, but the opposition is uh, on. Um, it's Thomas Stevens with the Executive Director of Kentucky Association of Health Plans. If you're online, uh, Mr. Stevens, you can you can go ahead now. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today for the first time on behalf of the Kentucky Association of Health Plans. As you may be aware, we are the trade association for Kentucky's commercial health insurance providers and managed care organizations. Uh, I think what you can see already from the comments uh, that have been brought forth by both Senator Girdler and Senator Alvarado, the complexity uh, of this issue, but KHP urges you to vote no on SB 44. Um, SB 44 allows a nonprofit organization, for example, a hospital foundation, pay private insurance premiums for someone who may be otherwise eligible for government-sponsored programs like Medicare or Medicaid. While we're particularly sympathetic to the plight of Kentucky's rural hospitals, uh, subsidizing providers at the expense of Kentucky's commercial insurance market and their members is a bad prescription for Kentucky. Um, in this subsidized private insurance marketplace, the providers can bill at higher rates. What happens with the patient? Uh, one, they can be left unknowingly with co-pays, deductibles, co-insurance on both benefits and prescriptions. Um, these patients were enrolled in Medicaid. These would be covered benefits. But of course, Medicaid reimburses providers at a lower rate. These practices undermine the individual market by skewing the risk pool, driving up the overall cost of premiums and ultimately health care costs for individuals and small businesses to buy health insurance in the commercial market. Um, this, one example that was provided by our membership is that the practice is prevalent with dialysis providers for patients with end-stage renal disease. These third-party entities, often funded directly or indirectly by providers or facilities, pay the patient premiums for their own gain since private insurers ultimately pay substantially higher amounts for dialysis treatments than public programs like Medicare and Medicaid. As we continue climbing out of the COVID-19 crisis that's affected every aspect of our economy, transferring what's effectively a provider bonus onto the backs of Kentucky's commercial insurance market, while well-intended in many respects, will lead to higher premiums for Kentucky's employers, employees, and individual policyholders at a time when that simply can't be borne. So on behalf of KHP, uh, we urge you to vote no on SB 44. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? Uh, Senator Alvarado. Just that uh, all members should have before them also a, a financial impact statement that 
says that it's not expected to materially increase administrative expense of insurers, and it's not expected to materially increase the total cost of health care in the Commonwealth. So I think the assessment determines that it wouldn't do that. Yes, and ma'am. If I may respectfully disagree with a few of the statements, is that um, we operate under an OIG opinion, so it is very highly regulated, and not everybody can go and open a nonprofit charity in order to do this. Secondly, we are not allowed by law to steer a patient to any specific health insurance plan. We lay out all of their options and they choose. So we cannot steer patients, as was mentioned with the kidney the kidney groups. It is not disease specific and it is not insurance plan specific. It is patient specific. We have a motion and a second already on the bill. Uh, if, if there's nothing else to be said, I think I'll have the secretary please call the roll. Senator Rocky Adams. Senator Alvarado. Aye. Senator Buford. If I, I, I vote aye and explain my vote quickly, Please. I think any time that we can prevent someone from going on to the Medicaid system, we should do everything possible. Because once they are on Medicaid, you may never get them off and they may desire not to go to work to keep the insurance based on the fact that the other side is too expensive. So uh, certainly support this highly. Thank you. Senator Girdler. Uh, can I explain? Yes, you can, Senator Girdler. Y'all got me tore up here. Uh, <laughs> and, and usually when I'm on the floor, I just keep my mouth shut and then stand up and point down or up. But Senator Carpenter said I can't do that. Uh, I wanted to pass. Uh, because I, I understand where the health plans are coming from. I understand where uh, Dr. Alvarado and you are coming from. I really do, and I hate it. So, and uh, if it makes you feel any better, uh, Senator Alvarado, I'm planning on voting yes for Senate Bill 45. Thank you. <laughs> so that that'll get us even, right? Fair enough. All right. Uh, but this one, I'm going to pass on. All that means is he's got to get up on the floor and sell it. Uh, and you ever heard him speak? Good salesman. Yeah. So, thank you. Senator Howell? Aye. Senator McGarvey? Aye. Senator Parrott? Aye. Senator Schickel? Aye. Senator Smith? Aye. Senator Storm? Aye. Chairman Carpenter? Aye. Just to make this known, uh, Senator McGarvey is a yes, and so but you're going to have to, you can't get it on consent because your friend Rick Girdler was a pass. So just. That's I, all right. I, I don't I, mind speaking on. on the floor. Mr. Hold on. Chairman. Hold on. You got you to gotta know here. <laughs> oh, did we have one? Yeah. Oh, well, daggone it. I was really wanting to give <laughs> Senator Girdler a hard time. <laughs> we got to harass. We got, I got to harass my co chair every now and I can, uh, let, uh, can Senator I, Alvarado. Can I say something? Uh, uh, no, the, no, Mr. You can't. Stevens, are you still on? Are you still on? Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. I'm here. All right. Uh, you see how much sympathy me and you get here? <laughs> 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 All these people just vote now. I just wanted you to see that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much. The bill does pass. Uh, appreciate your help, uh, your work on this. Ms. Cooper, appreciate you being here as well. Senator Alvarado, Senate Bill 45 is next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members, for the vote on 44. Um, Senate Bill 45 is along the same themes. Uh, this is a a patient protection bill that's going to help Kentuckians afford their medications. And I raise this important issue as both a legislator and as a practicing physician. I'm also joined today by Joey Klausing, who's a co-founder of Cure CF. He's online. And Dr. Ben Mudd from the Kentucky Pharmacists Association, who's also online. Uh, they join more than 20 advocacy groups like the American Cancer Society, Hemophilia Foundation, the Kentucky Medical Association, the Arthritis Foundation, uh, I think the American Diabetes Council, all who want to ensure that individuals suffering from chronic conditions have access to the medications they need. And Senate Bill 45 addresses a growing problem, which is a new insurance company practice called the Copay Accumulator Adjustment that's leading to increased and often surprising out-of-pocket costs for Kentuckians when they visit the pharmacy. As out-of-pocket costs have increased steadily over the years, many patients, especially those with chronic conditions, have come to rely on copay financial assistance programs to afford their medicines. However, many insurance companies are refusing to apply the value of payments made through copay assistance programs to patients' annual deductibles, and it's hurting Kentuckians. This would be like somebody in front of you in a drive through at McDonald's or at, um, at Starbucks paying for your meal or your coffee only to have the fast food uh, person there when you show up say, hey, we're going to charge you as well. 
It's, it's just not right. And as a physician, I find practices like these concerning. I know we've all heard from the insurance companies about making sure that patients have skin in the game when it comes to the cost of health care. And we do need to be good health care shoppers, I agree. And I've got a bill for health care transparency that everyone seems to oppose these days, but it's, it would allow patients to be able to shop for their health care more easily. But this practice goes too far, and it punishes patients through unexpected additional costs. Studies show that when a patient's share of prescription costs become too high, they often skip doses or they stop taking their medicines altogether, leading to even higher medical costs down the road in terms of hospitalizations, ER visits, and long-term uh, health issues. Unfortunately, this is another example of a barrier that interferes with the all-important patient-provider relationship where all treatment options should be decided. And we've all seen in their letters that we've gotten from the insurance companies this week that have a very complicated explanation, but I'll make it very short and sweet. The copay accumulator program doesn't help patients with chronic conditions. It only costs them more to receive the medicines that they actually need. And when a patient uses a copay assistance program, it's no different than any normal transaction at a pharmacy counter. The insurance company still gets paid, the pharmacist is still reimbursed, the patients still get their medicines, and is closer to meeting their annual deductible. To me, that's a win-win-win, and it should be for all of us in this committee as well. And let me give you an example. If you went to a restaurant with a friend, um, and they were there and said, hey, look, I'll pay for your dinner. I got a gift card for Christmas. I'll pay for your dinner. And they offer that as payment for your meal. And as you're getting ready to leave, the restaurant says, oh, 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 we haven't gotten your payment yet for your meal. You know, that's what the copay accumulator program basically does. It's saying someone's willing to pay it for you. And they're saying, we're going we're gonna to charge you again and charge you double. Senate Bill 45 would put an end to this unfair insurance a practice and ensure that patients aren't hit with unexpected bills when they pick up their medicines. And despite what you've heard this past week from some of these letters from our insurance uh, partners, Senate Bill 45 will not push patients to brand name drugs. This bill is only applicable when there is no generic available. And believe me, as a doctor, I can assure you, uh, when I write patients' medications, I'm incentivized to write for generic medicines. My quality measures from Medicare and from other agencies are based on how many generics I write. I get reports that compare me to other providers to say, how many generics are you writing? I think maybe I can count on my hand in 25 years of practice how many times I've told the patient, you must take a brand name over a generic. We've been incentivized for that, and we continue to be incentivized for that. So insurance companies are not harmed. The only ones that are harmed by these practices are the patients, which are your constituents and mine. And this bill helps our fellow Kentuckians afford and adhere to their medicines, and that's really what's most important. But you don't have to take my word for it. Take the word of the 20-plus advocacy groups that represent the Kentuckians that are affected by this unfair program. And it's the people who have the most skin in the game that are asked to continue to put even more skin in the game. And because of that, I'm going to ask for your support on this bill today. And I also want to introduce, again, I mentioned him earlier, is Joey Clousing, who's online with Cure CF. Mr. Clousing, if you're there, if you'd like to introduce yourself for the record and begin your testimony. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Dr. Alvarado. Hello, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for letting me speak today. Uh, I'm executive director of Cure CF. It's a charity in Louisville that raises money for cystic fibrosis. Uh, we have zero employees, so every dollar in goes out the door. Um, Many families in Kentucky be impacted by the copay accumulator. Uh, Luke has cystic fibrosis. He's 13 now. He has 24 years left to live. So if you look around at your committee, many of you are probably older than 37. If you had CF, you'd be dead right now, according to the odds. Uh, since he's been diagnosed, the life expectancy has increased, and that's only because of new drugs. These drugs are not cheap. There's no generic. I can't go down to Kroger and get it. It has to come from a mail order pharmacy. I can't get it filled at the Walmart or anywhere here local. The drug costs $24,987,000 a month. That's one drug. Luke's on 13 drugs just to stay alive. This isn't, you know, a cosmetic drug. This isn't to lose weight. This isn't because he smokes. This isn't because of high blood pressure. This is because God made him that way. That's the way he was born. The pharmaceutical companies provide assistance to us due to the cost of the drugs that are vital for Luke and others with cystic fibrosis and other rare diseases to take. And I use that word vital in the truest sense, the truest definition of vital. A few years ago, the insurance company changed their policy and decided not to uh, allow copay assistance payments received from the pharmaceutical company <clears throat> to count towards our deductible. Accordingly, we had two to $3,000 in extra expense when we normally hit our out-of-pocket maximum in January or February of every year. This is not this is not right. What's happening here is is we've got to get patients with chronic conditions. Medication is not optional or temporary. It's a permanent situation they're in. 
Kentuckians, much like Luke, should not have to choose between their health or their family's financial security. That's why we have to bring Senate Bill 45 to passage this year. Um, no patient should be penalized by their insurer, and that's what it is. Luke is being penalized, a 13-year-old, because the insurer, the money didn't come straight from my U.S. bank account or my Visa credit card to Blue Cross Blue Shield or Anthem or uh, Humana or United Healthcare. It came from someone else and went there. Yet they're saying that's not enough. You'll often hear, and you may hear later on, that it's too complicated and we need to pass this or push this down the line. It's not too complicated. It's very simple. They're receiving money from pharmacies, from copay assistance companies and cards. They should go toward my deductible. It's a payment. So when you hear too complicated later on, if they talk about that, think about Luke at age 13. And also when a 13 year old with CF. And lastly, I'll close with this. You know, you may say, well, they don't have skin in the game. You know, we need to get these patients that have skin in the game. That's crazy. This morning, I got up at 6 a.m. and did Luke's hour and a half chest percussions and breathing treatments, as I've done every day since he's born, hey, on April 28th, 2007. <clears throat> every month, he gets skin in the game, literally, when he goes to Norton Children's Hospital and gets pricked to get labs drawn for his condition to make sure his liver isn't deteriorating from cystic fibrosis. So if someone talks about skin in the game for a person with a chronically ill uh, child or chronically ill condition, that's disingenuous. I won't get to speak again, presumably. So I just ask for you, if you hear from other folks, these insurance companies like Anthem, who spent $125,000 in lobbying, or Humana, $122,000, or United Healthcare, $121,272, I've spent zero, zero dollars on lobbying. I'm a CF dad of a child with a life expectancy of 24 more years. So I ask for you to remember, have a little bell go off in your head if they object to this and say, oh, it's, it's, it's too complicated or it's, 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 um, it's not fair, or they don't have skin in the game. Think about Luke and the others with life expectancies of 37 or even less. I thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions at this time or later on. Thank you, Mr. Klausing. I've also got Dr. Ben Mudd from the Kentucky Pharmacists Association. Dr. Mudd, if you're there, if you'd like to introduce yourself for the record and provide your testimony as well. Yes, thank you, uh, Chairman Carpenter and members of the committee. <clears throat> um, my name is Dr. Ben Mudd. I, I'm a, a pharmacist uh, and also the executive director for the Kentucky Pharmacists Association. Uh, prior to joining KPHA this year, uh, I've spent the last nine years working in community pharmacies in Lebanon, Springfield, and Bardstown, Kentucky. Uh, our, our community pharmacists play an essential role in our healthcare system, uh, providing consistent care, and individualized care to, to our patients across the state. Uh, you know, one of the roles that that a pharmacist has is helping patients navigate chronic conditions, uh, including complex health insurance matters. Uh, I, you know, I went to pharmacy school to learn about um, conditions and how to treat them. But one of the hardest jobs of working as a pharmacist is helping patients find ways to pay for their medications. Um, and th these copay cards are our way to help patients manage out-of-pocket costs uh, making those costs more predictable and manageable. Uh, each year, it seems like out-of-pocket costs and, and deductibles, they, they go up every year. Uh, and just making these options available for Kentuckians more important. Uh, like they had mentioned, you know, these cards, they're similar to, to coupons that you would use at the grocery store. Patients come in with a card, you know, oftentimes, uh, we, we help patients navigate that system to sign up themselves at, at the pharmacy. Uh, they bring that to you and we bill that, the, we bill that as a secondary claim and the money is deducted from the patient's responsibility. I think it's important to know too that, that the patient still most of the time and uh, in, in what I've seen, they still have a copay. They still have patient responsibility, but this card may take their, their copay for, from, you know, $150 to, to 25 or, or 50. Almost all the cards that I see in community pharmacy, uh, they have a, a maximum. So they'll only pay $100 or, or 150. So if, if the patient's on a, a high deductible plan, they're still going to have a significant out of pocket cost for that medication. So it's not wiping their responsibility away completely. Uh, and from my experience, there very rarely is there a zero copay card that I've seen. 
uh, it should be known that, you know, the, the pharmacy, it is a secondary claim and, and the, the pharmacy really doesn't have a lot to gain from this. In addition to the money that the copay card would give us, uh, the, that the processor usually pays a dollar or two processing fee on top of the claim, which long story, but that's not all profit. Like there's, there's costs associated with submitting a claim to an insurance company. So it's unfortunate that these insurance companies are, are no longer allowing these, these dollars to go towards the annual deductible and out-of-pocket cost. And, you know, it's unfortunate that the patients find that shock and, and panic at the pharmacy counter. So, you know, I ask that you support this, uh, this legislation. I think as a pharmacist, you know, I've spent a lot of time helping patients and, and if we don't, if we don't pass this and allow these these dollars to go towards uh, the out-of-pocket max and deductibles for patients, we're going to see more issues with adherence where patients are skipping doses or stopping their medications altogether. And I think it was very important that, that it was noted that, you know, ultimately if patients can't afford medications and their can, health conditions continue to get worse, I feel that financial strain will force patients out of work only to seek uh, medical coverage through our state. Medicaid program. Mr. Chair, I'd move so this time that, that we adopt the uh, Senate Committee Substitute Number 1 to Senate Bill 45. Adopt that, please. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It is adopted. Thank you, okay. Senator Buford. Thank uh, you, Mr. Chairman. Now, just on, on the sub, I was going to bring that up, so thank you for, for that. Is on page 3. The only change is under on line 12. We added uh, what it says, by another in insured by another person for a prescription drug. We wanted to make sure that, that was clear that this is for medications and it couldn't be interpreted to be broader. So thank you for bringing that up. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Mudd, appreciate your testimony as well there on, on, on that issue. Uh, do you have another person? Uh, uh, just, just available for questions. They didn't have any testimony prepared. Okay. All right. Uh, at this time, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Senator Parrott has a question. Turn your microphone on, Senator Parrott. Senator Parrott, turn your... Senator... Uh, page three, line what? Page three, line 12, line 12 on the sub. You. Yeah, the, the words, it says for a prescription drug. Those are, that's the change in the sub from the Thank original you. bill. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we do have some folks that would like to talk uh, on the other side of the bill. I, I know uh, uh, we've already heard from uh, Thomas Stevens, and he's online, and also Connor Rowe. So, uh, Thomas, if Mr. Stevens, if you want to make a statement, or if, if Mr. Rose has a statement first, or both of you, I'll let you do that now. I'm happy well, to go Mr. first. Rose wants to go first. I certainly won't object. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you, Chairman Carpenter, Vice Chair Girdler, members of the committee. My name is Connor Rose. I'm with the Pharmaceutical Care Management Association. We're the National Trade Association uh, representing pharmacy benefit managers. Uh, PCMA respectfully opposes Senate Bill 45 as it eliminates an important tool used by plan sponsors to contain uh, the ever increasing costs of prescription drugs and providing those benefits. Uh, as you know, it does require health insurers to treat all manufacturer coupons as insurance contribution toward their deductible and overall out-of-pocket maximums, unless a medically appropriate generic equivalent is available. And to that point, I would note that there's some research back in 2014, uh, they looked at the top 200 drugs by spending and found that 51% of those uh, drugs that were coupon had no generic substitute. They may have had an alternative competing brand that achieved the same outcome, uh, but there were no generic substitutes for of over half of those. Uh, I would like to also emphasize at the outset of my testimony that PCMA does not oppose true means-tested patient assistance programs that help individuals afford their prescription drugs. In fact, a number of if many PBMs uh, operate uh, savings programs focused on the specialty drug space. We help identify and facilitate uh, patients' enrollment to need-based manufacturer, charitable, and other patient assistance programs. Uh, and I, I think it's important to note that difference. There's a difference between means tested patient assistance programs and then copay coupons, which are targeted marketing initiatives to individuals who already have health insurance. So, as you know, I think each year we we're having the same discussion about the ever increasing price of prescription drugs. And that puts patients at risk and health plan sponsors in the difficult position of having to cut benefits or increase premiums, copays and deductibles. And, you know, while health plans pay the vast amount of the members pres prescription drug costs, uh, drug manufacturers' price increases have forced health plans to create new benefit designs that keep monthly premiums as low as possible, but do require some members to shoulder uh, more of the cost before deductibles are met. Uh, drug manufacturers are encouraging patients to disregard formularies and lower cost uh, or preferred alternative brands by offering coupons to help patients cover that higher cost. 
Again, this ultimately steers patients away from cheaper alternatives uh, and towards the more expensive brand drugs with the less favorable placement on a formulary. And I would just like to provide the committee with a few facts uh, on manufactured coupons. We do know that the prices for uh, drugs with manufactured coupons increase faster, about 12 to, 3, 12 to 13% per year compared to non-coupon drugs, which increased at about 7% per year. Uh, we know that if Medicare's ban on coupons were not enforced, cost of the program would have increased 10, $48 billion over 10 years. We know that coupons were responsible for a $32 billion increase in spending on prescription drugs uh, for commercial plans. And we know that for every million dollars in manufactured coupons for brand drugs, manufacturers reap more than $20 million in profit, a 20 to one return. And again, copay coupons by definition target those who already have prescription drug coverage. Uh, they are not means tested uh, or designed to help the uninsured. And again, they are considered illegal kickbacks in Medicare and Medicaid, but uh, still allowed in the commercial space. So to mitigate the, the cost driving effect of, of coupons, health plan sponsors, uh, Institute uh, copay accumulator programs, uh, they dis by disallowing the manufacturer's coupon toward the patient's out-of-pocket maximum deductible because the patient hasn't actually incurred that cost. And again, these programs help plan sponsors mitigate the harmful impact of manufacturer coupons on the overall cost, plan cost and member premiums, ensuring that the patient has the incentive to stay on the formulary and use the plan design as it was uh, offered by the uh, sponsor. Uh, and again, I mean, I think it's safe to say that uh, manufacturer coupons do decrease costs for patients. Uh, while they do uh, decrease an individual's cost, patient's cost at the pharmacy counter, they don't reduce actual costs. And in fact, coupons are often temporary and the individual patient likely will pay more when the coupon goes away, or expires or reaches its full uh, financial value instead of being started on the preferred formulary drug from the start. And so at the end of the day, it's the manufacturer who benefits by forcing the plan and indirectly the patient to pay for the more expensive non-preferred brand drug. Uh, those are uh, my comments. I'm happy to take any questions. If not, I'll pass the mic to Tom. Thanks, Tom. Tom, uh, Mr. Stevens, if you have any comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, obviously, the uh, very unenviable task of following up on uh, Mr. Klausing's uh, testimony, as well as Senator Alvarado and Mr. Mudd. Um, the rising cost of prescription drugs is a concern for all payers, and as Connor noted, uh, SB 45 is narrowly targeted to Kentucky's commercial markets. Uh, of course, principal reason for that is that um, these sorts of discount cards are explicitly banned by the federal government, which considers them to be a, a kickback. Um, it's also notable that these sorts, uh, within the confines of this particular legislation, the Kentucky Employees Health Plan, um, covering our, our teachers and, in fact, members of, of this body, um, you know, are also carved out of this legislation. So, you know, what, what would be the reason for that? Um, copay cards may temporarily reduce out-of-pocket costs for patients. Um, they do not reduce actual costs because plan sponsors and patients are on the hook for the full cost of the drug once the patient reaches their deductible. Fiscal note on this bill underscores the significant uh, financial burden it imposes. Uh, specifically, uh, it talks about an increase in premiums in the commercial market <clears throat> up to uh, $1.18 per member per month. Uh, these sorts of healthcare mandates uh, passed by the General Assembly contribute to higher costs that are most felt by small employers, individual payers who don't have the resources to self-insure. Um, and after what's transpired uh, with a particular emphasis on Kentucky's small businesses in the last year, a government mandate increasing um, health insurance premiums isn't the right answer today. Uh, KHP uh, strongly opposes SB 45 uh, and ask you to vote against it today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Subject to your questions. Thank you. Uh, Senator Alvarado. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very briefly, this bill has nothing to do with increasing insurance premiums. It's all about helping Kentuckians. Uh, if health plans increase premiums, it's only to protect their own bottom lines. So I know we mentioned of profitability was mentioned here about pharmaceuticals. I don't think we want to talk about the profitability of our insurance companies as well. We want them to be viable, but there's also a case to be made there. Um, also, it does, it does not include Medicaid or other state employee health plans because a state employee health plan is a self-insured plan. That's why it's excluded, and Medicaid doesn't have co-pays. And also, as far as facts, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, since 2006, health insurance deductibles have increased 300 percent. There's been an 89 percent increase in what patients pay in co-insurance. So you, you do the math here, how that, how that is in the line. The states of West Virginia, Virginia, Arizona, Georgia, Illinois, 
have moved to adopt patient protection laws like this regarding copay accumulator adjustment policies, and there's several other states that have it proposed as well. Also, if you look at the fiscal note, uh, again, I think it's inconclusive is how it's as written because the fiscal impact could be $1.18. It could also be zero, is what it's saying there, as far as the costs towards health care. I'll leave it at that, and I just implore members to vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any members that have questions or comments? I have a, a motion uh, as amended by the committee sub by Senator Buford. Do I have a second? Second by Senator Storm. Uh, I'll ask the secretary please call the roll. Senator Rocky Adams. Senator Alvarado. Aye. Senator Buford. I'd like to explain my vote. Yes, sir. I, um, I have dealt with these uh, PBMs, pharmaceutical benefit managers, and um, I'm, my doctor tries to prescribe Lipitor. So I end up getting the generic. And I try, of course, I get prior authorization. Uh, I, I give it to the, the lady behind the scenes of the doctor's office. She spends a half hour to 45 minutes on hold for this PBM to give her a response. So after 45 minutes, I go on and head for the drugstore. Guess what? Nothing. Nope, haven't got it yet. Call back tomorrow. Nothing, haven't got it yet. Third day, maybe. And they might, they might turn it down. What has that cost the doctor? How much does he have to increase his next fee to sit on the phone with that PBM, and I with Newt Gingrich, get rid of them all, the cost that they charge to save you a dollar, you probably could get a dollar and a nickel back in savings. Thank you. Senator Girdler. I'd like to explain my yes vote. Please, sir. Uh, the only thing that I fear here, and I've, I've, I've expressed this to my friend, Dr. Alvarado, uh, I fear that uh, every time we make a law that, that says the insurance company has to pay more, and I understand why you're doing it, and just like uh, Senator Buford said, I understand all that. But when it comes down to the long run, we are going to end up paying more. Now, if this is only $12 a year, you know, but every time, every time you go to the gas pumps and it's $12 a year, $12 a year, $12 a year, eventually it's going to get where we're going to be on, thank God, I hope we never have it, but it's going to be on government-run health insurance. You don't want it, and I don't want it. So that's my biggest fear is, is, is that we're going to price ourselves out of business, and, and it scares me. But anyway, I do vote yes for this. I do agree with the analogy that, Oh, by the way, you said when you go eat with somebody, you've never eaten with Shickle because he ain't bought yet. So uh, I just wanted you to know that, too. So thank you. Senator Howell. Aye. Senator McGarvey. Aye. Senator Parrott. Aye. Senator Shickle. He's mad. Uh-oh. Trouble. Senator Smith. Senator Storm? Aye. Chairman Carpenter? Aye. The motion does pass by favorable, cons by favorable expression. So we'll have the bill on the floor. Do, do we have a motion for consent or anything like that? Or, or do, you just want to, do you want to do the bill on the floor? Uh, consent is fine if the committee would like to have it. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The bill is on consent. Thank you, sir. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, Senator McGarvey has a question or comment. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I was out of the room and like to record it as a yes vote on Senate Bill 71. 71. 71. That would be my bill. We really appreciate that, Senator. Oh, Garvey. I record yeah. me as a yes vote. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think we have our business is concluded. Uh, motion for adjournment.